Hello, everyone. I'm Kyle Gerald, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of Countryside Free Methodist Church in Sandusky, Michigan. The service you are about to hear was previously recorded, but we'd invite you to stop by and check out one of our services in action at 10 a.m. each Sunday here at Countryside in Sandusky, Michigan. Or check it out on our Facebook or YouTube page. God bless and have a wonderful day. Um, last Sunday, Pastor Kyle began a series on the deliverance and exodus of the children of Egypt from Egypt. The Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years, and they had learned the Egyptian laws, Egyptian holidays, and the worship of idols. So after the Israelites left Egypt, God gave this infant nation new laws and new holidays and the correct way to worship the Lord, which included stone altars and animal sacrifices. But their first worship service was held in their homes with a clear reference to Jesus with blood on the doorpost and as they ate the Passover lamb. I'm reminded of Franklin Graham who said, the only cure for sin is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So our topic this morning is worship, and I appreciate your worship team so much. Uh, they led right into me into that uh, whole concept of worship this morning. They do a great job. Appreciate you so much. It, True worship is reaching out to God. Uh, last Sunday, Pastor Kyle closed his message by telling us how much he loved us when his grandson raises his hands asking to be held. It's a vivid picture of how God loves it when we reach out to him. And whether we sense it or not, the Lord has been waiting for that moment and is already reaching down to us. It's an amazing thing, but God is the initiator of all love. Let me be the first to confess that my worship is not always what it ought to be. Have you ever fallen asleep in a worship service? It's not always the fault of the speaker. It was more of a weakness in my part when I fell asleep. I was listening and suddenly my eyes closed. And then I opened them quickly, hoping no one noticed. And then a second time. And the third time my head dropped. And I jumped like this. <laughs> I think perhaps we've all had that happen. But it's not always the fault of the speaker. I'm sure in my case, it, it was me. Acts chapter 20 tells us that as the great apostle Paul spoke, a young man sitting in an open window fell asleep. And uh, when he fell asleep, he fell three stories to his death. And then Paul went out and raised him up, and he returned to life. Fortunately, I was not sitting in an open window when I fell asleep, but it happens, and perhaps it's happened to you. And falling asleep in worship service is often what our culture today, that's their perception of worship. They see worship as boring, with no reference or relevance to their everyday lives, but true worship is nothing like that. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Mark chapter 14, where we get a beautiful picture of humble, public, unabashed worship. This was a dinner party that took place in the Bethany, the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. In the custom of that day, only men were invited to sit around the table. On the first slide, listen as I begin reading from Mark chapter 14, verse 3. While Jesus was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster box of very precious perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. 
Notice that the woman made no announcement of what she was doing or why she was doing it. It was nonverbal form of worship. However, others in the room had some thoughts, and they quickly expressed their feelings. On the next slide, we pick up on verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. On the next slide, verse 6, Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. On the next slide, verse 8, Jesus continued. She did what she could. She poured the perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Notice that when everyone else criticized the woman, Jesus praised her for her lavish expression of love. This woman shows us what humble worship looks like. Her actions seem extreme to others. She went above and beyond the ordinary. But God is pleased when we show our love for him in ways that go beyond the ordinary. That's how much this woman loved Jesus. And she sets a high standard of worship and love for him. John chapter 12 tells us that this woman is actually Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. You may recall that later time, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. On another occasion, Mary and Martha had a dinner party, and Jesus was their special guest. Martha was busy in the kitchen taking care of all the details for the meal while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, listening as he taught the other guests. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all myself? Tell her to help me. Martha was criticizing Mary for worshiping and wasting time. But Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Now back to the home of Simon the leper. Mary was criticizing for wasting her money on Jesus. Mary's act of worship seemed extreme to the other guests, even wasteful. The perfume she poured on Jesus' head was not some cheap brand. No, it was pure nard, which is made from the root of the spike nard plant. Spike nard is mentioned only one other time in the Bible. In the Song of Psalms, the Song of Psalms, Song of Songs, I can say that. The woman anointed herself with spikenard as her lover was reclining on his couch. Nard is a unique fragrance, and its aroma was an indication that the very best was being given. This pure nard was sealed in a stone container and rarely used. It might have been saved for a wedding or preparing the body of a loved one for burial. Mary broke the jar and poured it all over Jesus' head. It was an extreme gesture, but that's what Jesus loves in our worship. Jesus loves it when we show our love for him in extravagant ways. I like what Chick Chuck Swindoll says about Mary's extravagant act of worship. In his book, Living Above the Level of Mediocrity, Swindoll writes, I believe this event has been, been preserved to teach us one major message. There are certain times when extravagance is appropriate. Swindoll goes on to say, in our day of emphasis on high-tech calculations and finely tuned budgets with constant reminders of cost, restraints, and never being guilty of doing anything outside the bound of the ordinary. So anything beyond the basic is, seems excessive. 
if you buy into that Spartan philosophy, then everything you build will be functional, ordinary, and basic. Everything you purchase will be at the lowest possible cost. And everything you do will be average. Ouch. That hurts. I'm cost conscious. Swindoll goes on to say, I feel there is times when extravagant gifts are not only appropriate, they're occasionally absolutely necessary. The problem is too many of us in the context of worship do just as little as possible. In one of the early Apollo missions, someone stuck his head inside the capsule and said to the astronauts getting ready to take off, well, how does it feel? One of the astronauts replied with a grin, it makes you think twice in here when you realize everything in this whole project was constructed according to the lowest bid. <laughs> A lot of people in their lives live according to the lowest bid. And sadly, that's how many of us worship the Lord. Let's let go way beyond the ordinary when it comes to showing our love for the Lord. Stop and consider what we owe the Lord. One of the great hymns of the church was written by Isaac Watts. He wrote, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. We owe the Lord everything we are and everything we have. It would be wise to praise him in a way that others consider wasteful. If you truly love the Lord, we will love him humbly, extravagantly, and we'll love him expensively. Mary sat a high standard for us. It leaves me feeling quite inadequate. I have not lived up to the high standard that Mary has set for us. And that is what the Bible does for us. It proves that when we stand in the Lord's presence, we need for him to look beyond our human failures and see the righteousness of Jesus in our heart and in our lives. We do our best, but we need Jesus to fulfill the righteousness that God requires. Notice the value of Mary's act of worship. The perfume was valued at more than a year's wages. Mary's act of worship cost a lot of money, and she willingly and gladly gave it away because she loved Jesus that much. Worship is not about getting our needs met. Oh, we run into that often. True worship is about giving our very best to the one and only one that is worthy of our praise. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, King David could have worshipped God at no cost to himself. You see, David wanted to buy Arana's threshing floor as a place of worship. However, Arana said, take it. And while you're at it, take some of my oxen and some of my wood to make an appropriate offering. But David said, no, I insist on buying it, for I will not present a burnt offering to the Lord my God that has cost me nothing. In David's mind, it was not real worship if it did cost him nothing. True worship always costs us something. If it doesn't cost us anything, it's not real worship. God is our prime example of the great giver. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The Bible tells us God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. The cross demonstrates how much God loved us. Jesus left heaven and laid aside his glory. He gave his all. He emptied himself all but love. Jesus endured the pain, died in our place for our sins, 
and was raised from the grave, defeating death so that he could offer eternal life to each of us as a free gift. All we have to do is accept that gift of forgiveness and trust him as our Lord and our Savior. His love is free to us, but it cost him everything. And we love the Lord because he first loved us. Loving the Lord is the first and greatest commandments. I use stories. Uh, modern day parables help me to remember bits of truth. Many year, years ago, Jack Eckhart, builder of a drugstore chain we now call Rite Aid, later he trusted Christ with his life. A short time later, he was walking through one of his stores where he saw copies of Playboy Penthouse on the magazine rack. Eckhart was no longer in active management, but he called the president of the company and urged him to get rid of the pornographic magazines. The president protested because those magazines brought in big profits. Eckhart himself stood to lose a lot of money because he was the largest stockholder at that time. But at his persistence, the offensive magazines were removed from all 1,700 drugstores. When asked why he did it, Eckhart simply replied, God wouldn't let me off the hook. You see, he loved the Lord more than he loved money, and so he had to take a stand. He did it out of love, it as an act of worship. We owe the Lord our complete devotion and our obedience. Tim Keller, pastor of the Church of Manhattan in New York, talks about meeting with a woman who had just started attending his church. Before that, she had, hadn't heard about the distinction between the gospel and religion, between grace and work-based righteousness. She had not heard about God's unconditional love. Instead, she thought that God accepted us only if we were good enough, and she told her pastor that the new message of grace was scary. Pastor Keller asked her why it was scary, and she replied, if I was saved by good works, then there would be a limit to what God could ask of me or put me through. It's like I would be like a, a taxpayer with rights. I would have done my duty, and now I deserve a certain quality of life. I thought with good deeds, you earn equal amount of good deeds from God. But if I'm a sinner, saved by grace, then there's nothing he can't ask of me. Pastor Keller said she understood the dynamics of grace and gratitude. Since God has given his one and only son and Jesus gave his life in place of ours, then we owe the Lord our lives and everything we have. She knew if Jesus really had done all of that for her, she would no longer be her own. She would joyfully and gracefully belong to Jesus who provides grace for her at an infinite cost to himself. You see, when we truly understand how much Christ loved us, we can't help but love him in the way he loved us. That kind of love requires a great deal from us. Isaac Watts put it this way, love so amazing, so divine, demands our soul, our life, our all. God's love for us is unconditional and unending. He has forgiven us of every mistake and every failure. And all we have to do to, is accept his love and forgiveness. Then he promises to take us to his home to live with him eternally. So how shall we respond to God's great love for us? Do our actions really convey our love for the Lord? Is it enough to just put a few dollars in the offering plate on Sunday morning? Is it enough, is it enough to just put an hour on Sunday morning for a time of worship? Mark chapter 12, Jesus sat down and watched how much money individuals put in the temple offering plate. 
Many rich people threw in large amounts of money. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Jesus said it was all that she had to live on. She gave all she could. The Lord watches to see what we give to him. And in our scripture today, Mary gave more than a whole year's wages. So how much should we give financially? The Bible tells us you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. If we love the Lord, we will love him extravagantly, and we will love him expensively, and we will love him openly. Mary broke the social customs of that day. Women did not recline at the table with men. The woman ate in another room. But Mary, in front of a room full of men, openly expressed her love for Jesus. She openly expressed herself to public ridicule and criticism, and they rebuked her harshly. But that didn't matter to Mary. She was willing to risk the public ridicule and shame because she loved Jesus that much. That's convicting for me, folks. Mary sets a high example for us. If we love Jesus as much as Mary, we will show our love for the Lord, even if it brings criticism. Now, compare Mary's actions with that of Judas Iscariot. Jesus told his disciples how he would be rejected by the Jewish leaders and condemned to the most painful death. And just as Jesus predicted, when he arrived in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the scribes began looking for a way to arrest him privately, away from the crowds who believed he was the Messiah. Knowing this, Judas Iscariot went secretly to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver Jesus over to you? They were pleased with Judas, and they gave him 30 pieces of silver, and on that dark night, he led them to Jesus. Mary showed great love for Jesus, and who was it that rebuked Mary? John's Gospel, chapter 12, tells us that it was Judas Iscariot who initiated criticism against Mary. Mary and Judas Iscariot are total opposites. Mary showed her love for the Lord publicly. Judas betrayed Jesus privately in secret. Mary loved the Lord expensively, more than a year's wages. Judas sold the Lord cheaply for just 30 pieces of silver. Mary was criticized and scolded for her devotion. The chief priests were very pleased with Judas. Judas accused Mary of wasting her money, but Judas wasted his life. Jesus called Judas the one doomed for destruction. Judas ended up hanging himself in the potter's field where he and other strangers would be buried in unmarked graves. If we love the Lord, we will show our love for him extravagantly, expensively, and we will show our love for him publicly, and we will show our love for the Lord privately. Actually, those who worship the Lord privately are the ones most apt to show their love for the Lord publicly. Jesus often went away by himself to give his full attention to his Father in heaven, and that is what he tells us to do. On the next slide, Jesus said, but when you pray, Go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray for your Father in private. We Christians pray everywhere we go, and that is good. We pray in our cars, we pray before meals, we pray as we lay in our beds at night. Unfortunately, most of our prayers are simply requests, things we want or need. I encourage you to set aside time to worship the Lord privately. Praise him for his vast universe he created. Praise him for his mighty power. Praise him for his 
surpassing greatness. Praise him for his holy nature, his righteousness, and his great enduring love for us. Thank him for salvation and forgiveness. Thank the Lord for sending the Holy Spirit who convinces us of sin. He is the comforter who provides guidance, assurance, and great joy when we come into his presence. We worship in our thoughts, with our words, and with our actions. Actions of worship are powerful. Did you notice that when Mary came into Simon's house to show her love for Jesus, she didn't speak a word? But her actions spoke volumes. Yes, the Lord loves to hear us verbalize our praise, but let's focus on some silent acts of worship that we might take part in. Public acts of worship can be showy. I've seen it, perhaps you have too. It's to see, receive the approval of others. Please don't waste your time in cheap acts of worship designed to receive the attention and praise of other people. But what acts of worship might we take privately to show our love and devotion for the Lord, our Savior? I suggest that you find a place where you can be alone and then worship with your entire being. <clears throat> we often bow our heads in prayer. It's a good thing. But consider some other physical postures that we might take. When you worship the Lord privately, try looking up to heaven. We sang, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, and I was visualizing, looking up. When you worship the Lord, praise the Lord with your hands. Fold your hands, open your hands, Hands to receive or praise him with your hands of surrendering to his love. Or like Pastor Kyle, grandson, who opened his arms asking to be held. Try it in the private. Open your arms and ask the Lord to hold you. And when you do, just remember that he's been reaching down to you all the time. He reaches down before we reach up. Jesus often left the crowds to pray privately. So how do you picture Jesus? Are his hands raised? Is he looking into heaven? Is he kneeling? I picture Jesus kneeling. I believe kneeling is beneficial for us. Humble acts of worship remind us of how small we are and how great the Lord is. If you add acts of worship to your prayers, you will be blessed. He is our Savior, the Creator, the Almighty One. No words are necessary, but added words of praise, of thanksgiving are appropriate. The Bible tells us, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, or should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The psalmist wrote, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. I want you to recognize it's not a command. Kneeling in the Lord's presence is appropriate and good for us. He doesn't need us to pray, kneel and pray. And when we can't sleep at night, many of us are pray in our beds, and that's good. It's better than counting sheep. But let me suggest that as you pray, right there in bed, in the darkness, raise your hands to the Lord. And when you feel down, try this. Raise your hands and repeat the words of the hymn written by Thomas Dorsey. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me home to the light. Precious Lord, take my hand. And when my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, 
Hear my cry. Hear my call. Hold my hand lest I fall. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me home. How will we respond to the Lord's great love for us? Isaac Watts thought about what the, Jesus did for him there on the cross. He wrote, we're the whole realm of nature mine. Were that a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. The Lord is worthy of our worship and praise. So show your love for the Lord extravagantly, expensively, publicly, and privately. Let's close our time in, together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your great love that you showed to us through Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you bless this congregation as you have blessed them in the past. Continue to bless them. They gather in your name. Bless each one of them in their everyday lives. Then bring us back together as the Lord's family of God. For we pray to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please stand. We are dismissed. Thanks so much for joining us today. Check out our webpage at countrysidefm.org for more opportunities to connect with us. God bless.